Hello, hello, Mordimers here and welcome to really mind-blowing game uh, which happened in 1896 in Nuremberg in Germany and I will just introduce you the gentleman who played, so Emanuel Lasker the world champion, the second world champion in the uh, history and his estimated ranking at that time 2836 so definitely he was number one at that time and he was 27 years old, quite experienced player already and he played as black and uh, Emmanuel Lasker was world champion just two years because he won the, uh, the championship uh, match against Wilhelm Steinitz uh, in 1894 and he kept this world champion title for 27 years that's quite a long time and Emmanuel Lasker became the world champion after the romantic chess era in 19th century you know romantic attacking style uh, that was the dominating style of the chess and then Wilhelm Steinitz uh, showed the positional style and he became the first world champion and Emmanuel Lasker brought something new something what leading chess players of that era just didn't understand he was ahead of that era so definitely number one in the world and his opponent ladies and gentlemen harry nelson pillsbury from usa in my opinion he should become the world champion at that time but i will explain you what happened that he didn't have that chance so uh, his ranking at that time 2736 definitely very strong he was number five in the world and he was only 23 years old and why i think he was very strong at that time in 1895 just one year before this game he won the strongest tournament of that times legendary tournament in hastings and he was better than mikhail chigorin emmanuel lasker Siegbert tarasz wilhelm steinitz karl schlechter david janowski joseph henry blackburn jacques mises and couple more very famous very strong players so that's some achievement isn't it and he was the only person who could win actually against uh, emmanuel lasker the the world champion match uh, but because he got infected by syphilis uh, he couldn't win another uh, tournament in St. Petersburg, which could probably um, force Emmanuel Lasker to accept the challenge for the world champion uh, match. And I would like to tell you a little more about Pillsbury, how extraordinary he was. And just to give you a feelings, who was sitting against the world champion Emmanuel Lasker. So Pillsbury was a very, very strong blindfold chess player. Uh, he could play uh, at 22 chess boards at the same time without watching at them and also he could play chess, checkers and the card game whist at the same time okay so that's something and also he had extraordinary memory so for example he could recall the long list of words uh, after hearing them only once or looking at them only once and then he could, you know, repeat them uh, forward and backward. And actually, I have a little challenge before we start the game. So I'm going to display uh, one of the lists presented to uh, Mr. Pillsbury, which he memorized and, of course, uh, repeated forward and backward and uh, try to memorize as many as you can while I enjoy my cup of tea. Okay, ready? Uh, could you do that? If you could do that, actually, then congratulations. And I strongly recommend you train harder to become the world champion. I think you have a huge predisposition and huge chances to win the, the game against the match against Magnus Carlsen. That's something incredible if you could memorize. Uh, but you can leave the comment and tell me how many words you memorize, actually. Uh, and without further ado, let's jump into the game. 
So uh, Mr. Pillsbury open with e4. We have e6, d4, d5, French defense, knight on c3 and knight on f6. And here we have e5, Steinitz uh, variation, knight f on d7 and now f4. Uh, and here c5, also the most popular move, and now knight f3, which is usually played move, and uh, Pillsbury actually had a different idea here, and different plan, also uh, very interesting. So he played d takes on c5, uh, and now we have knight on c6 by Emmanuel Lasker. And here uh, Pillsbury play very important move in French defense, he play a3. a3 takes away uh, the square before from the knight, because knight could jump here and harass the, the bishop, because usually uh, in French defense bishops go on d3 and support the advance of the pawns, f4 and, and g4. So uh, that's why it was played. And here we have knight on c5. Uh, of course, Lasker could play also bishop on c5, it looks like more natural move, uh, but maybe he didn't want to go for, you know, queen on g4 and, and castle, knight on f3, and uh, black would have to stay with the king on the king side here and face the uh, standard attack with, you know, bishop on d3, uh, f5, break the pawn structure here and uh, maybe have the decisive attack. So this is why we have knight on c5. Uh, and okay, uh, b4 by Pillsbury, kicking the knight, knight go back to d7, and here another interesting move by Pillsbury, bishop on d3. This is, I know, this is standard move in the French defense, nothing fancy, but if black would try, for example, undermine the center uh, of white here, this e5 pawn is very, very annoying for French um, defense, for example, f6, it's impossible because of queen on h5. If knight on f3, the most popular move in these uh, structures, uh, then actually that would not be possible to move the queen. So now g6 would have to be played, maybe bishop on g6, and after exchanging, white get the rook here. So uh, definitely interesting idea with playing bishop on d3. Uh, so Lasker try to play on the queen side now, we have a5 and white have to think what to do. So actually you can uh, think what would you play in this position as white? Uh, because what is the problem? If white actually takes the pawn, uh, then black would have this rook very active. It would be already developed and quite dangerous on a file uh, and also if white try to wait uh, for the exchange the same uh, black would just have fully operational rook on the a file so this is why pillsbury pushed the pawn to b5 uh, we have knight c on b8 and now knight on f3 developing the knight we have knight on c5 making a space for the knight very important move and as you see black are quite behind in development and that's a uh, world champion but in french defense it's uh, nothing unusual uh, we have bishop on e3 by Pillsbury, knight b on d7 as planned, and now castle by uh, Pillsbury. We have g6 by Lasker, so now f5 is not really possible. Uh, and here, knight on e2, very interesting move. So white finished development, and now they are gonna maneuver the pieces uh, with the very, very interesting plan, so pay attention what is going on. Uh, we have bishop on e7, developing the bishop, queen on e1 now, knight on b6, and now knight f to d4. So this knight not going to d4. And now the knight stay on e2 and d4 instead of uh, f3. Okay, so that's a huge difference and you will understand what was uh, Harry Pillsbury plan. Bishop on d7, continuing development and now queen on f2. So this is the all the remaneuvering and now white actually have a very serious threat. Can you find this threat? If you look at the position, can you see what white can do? 
I, I think everybody could find it because if black plays something like h5 just you know that's quite natural move against uh, g4 uh, for for black then white actually have very dangerous knight on e6 and this is the move winning the pawn and creating really comfortable position for white. Now white can actually win back the, the material and uh, get the extra pawn. Uh, so for example knight on e6, now bishop on b6 with attack on the queen, queen b6, queen b6 and now bishop c5 uh, getting back the queen so uh, queen c5 knight on c5 and the position is better for white uh, because with extra pawn and also this isolated black pawn are uh, really easy to play for white uh, so this is why emmanuel lasker uh, who was the strongest player in the world of course uh, don't fall for such a trap and play knight b on a4 and now the knight is defended twice so there are no problems with this uh, battery and now we have another uh, position where we have to decide as white what to play next so uh, can you imagine what's your plan can you can you plan ahead what to do so for example if you play something like g4 and you attack this is just quite standard attack against the french defense the problem is after queen on c7 f5 uh, g takes on f5 g takes on f5 and castle how you gonna get to the black king and how you gonna defend your king Actually, it's not really comfortable position for, for white, uh, for the engine is still, you know, uh, very, very playable, uh, but the white have to be very careful. So instead of getting all the initiative, white have to be very, very precise. So uh, also another problem in this position, the knight actually, after moving to a4, can jump to b2 and attack this bishop and that would be very uncomfortable for white as well so this is why harry nelson pillsbury play rook a on b1 so now the knight can't jump here and also this rook supporting the pawn uh, on b5 we have h5 now and again what to play in this position pillsbury play very very interesting move b6 so what is the idea uh, first the square b5 now is available for the bishop and for the knight and from there knight can jump wherever to c7 which is controlled by this pawn uh, but also for example for to d6 maybe not now but in the future so very uncomfortable moreover knight on b6 is impossible because of this tactics knight on e6 okay so now black of course can play something like knight on d3 with attack on the queen uh, but after knight on g7, king f8, c takes on d3, king g7 and bishop on b6, white again have much better position, extra pawn and black has this isolated pawn, so it would be very comfortable for white. Uh, so this is why here Emmanuel Lasker actually play knight on d3, so eliminated one of the potential jumper of b5 square. Uh, we have c takes on d3 and now Lasker winning the pawn on a3. Uh, and here again, uh, what to play next? Harry Nelson Pillsbury play in his style. He play f5, f5. Uh, of course, Emmanuel Lasker take this. Or if not, then he would be in the trouble. So g takes on f5. And now the game really starts to shine. Pillsbury play knight on f4, really great move. So now you understand why the knight was moved to e2 to jump to f4, okay? So now we have these two knights, very nice outpost. And what are the ideas here? So for example, this knight can't uh, attack the f5. Uh, and then another knight can attack on d5. So there are a lot of tactics here. Also, if this bishop disappears, then actually these knights can attack also e6. So a lot of very, very tactical ideas here and Lasker have to be uh, very careful. The best move for Lasker in this position is rook on c8. But to understand all of that, 
it's extremely difficult. So I believe Emmanuel Lasker calculated that. And what could happen? I just give you a couple of examples. If queen on g3 immediately, which is very, very dangerous, uh, because the queen can go to g7, then the knight can jump to h5 and do some, you know, bad things to the king. Uh, queen on e7, and now knight on f5. That's what I said. E takes on f5, knight on d5, and black has some resources like h4. And now I will just show you one of the lines. Uh, white would have to misplace the queen. And if white try something like queen on g7, then queen f8, uh, knight f6, king d8, and black actually stands better. White don't have anything here, okay? So definitely queen on g3 immediately doesn't work. Knight on d5, uh, it's also interesting idea. E takes on d5, knight takes on f5, now bishop takes on f5 and queen takes on f5. Uh, and it looks like white have quite strong attack, but after queen on d7 again, black just stands better, okay? It's um, extra minor piece and it's quite comfortable here. But after rook on c8, white actually could improve the position by rook a1. And it improves a lot because now the bishop is under attack. And now if bishop is defended, for example, rook on c3, then queen on g3 as planned. Queen on e7, and now again knight on f5, e takes on f5, knight d5, h4, attacking the, the queen, but queen now can go to e1 and attack this rook, so the rook is attacked twice, and also the rook is defender of the bishop, uh, and also keep in mind that the queen is still under attack, so black would have to do something, so if queen still want to watch at the bishop, so for example queen on f8, uh, there are other lines but uh, even more complicated, then knight on c3, now bishop before pinning the knight, uh, and now white would have to give back the exchange, so rook on a4, bishop on a4, and now d4, and again the position is very very complicated, but white probably is slightly better and have a good chances to win that game. But that would be, you know, very complicated. Uh, also, what's possible after rook on a1, uh, black actually could retreat with the bishop to c5, and then queen on g3, Black could do something stronger than queen on e7. Black could play queen on b6 with creating this powerful battery. Uh, it's not so easy for white to continue the attack now. So first rook f on b1. So retreating from uh, this semi open file. Uh, that is the only move actually queen on a7 and now white rook a4 luring the bishop but taking by bishop is actually losing after knight f on e6 and after taking the queen on g6 actually winning the game that would be devastating for black this is why here what black would have to find is b5 b5 the only move and now after queen on g7 which look very very dangerous rook f8 now knight on h5 and this already looks very very bad for black so i can imagine why emmanuel lasker didn't want to go for that and but now black would, would have to play here not taking the rook not playing any moves like that b4 b4 is the most powerful move and now this knight gonna fall uh and otherwise, you know, this bishop gonna fall and uh, black gonna win the game. So what white would have to play actually is knight on f6 with check, king e7. And now white have choice. Uh, but it's extremely difficult to find. So the easier way, maybe easier, maybe not. Knight on f5 with check. Okay, you follow me? E takes on f5. And now knight d5 with check. And that would be after king on e8. That would be, you know, uh, just 
threefold repetition and uh, that would be a draw so that the chance for white just to draw this is how dangerous a position would be if black just create this battery okay uh, so that's a good idea for black uh, and also if after king on e7 white still want to fight for the win then white have to play rook a5 sacrificing the rook here because now this is of course impossible and queen has to do something so queen a5 but now knight on h7 and rook can be moved from here okay so if rook moves then there are actually mating ideas with bishop on g5 winning this this rook and uh, that would be totally insane so black would have no moves there are no good moves here they, they would have to wait uh, so b3 and after knight on f5 rook takes on f5 queen g5 defending the bishop and now uh, the knight can you know play some some moves like take on f5 uh the position is slightly better for white and white probably could fight for a win here uh the pawn probably would be lost and uh and yeah so that was the only way white could try to win in this position but as you see this would be so complicated so after uh, rook on c8 and rook on a1 all of these lines were just terrifying so of course it's easy to understand why uh, manuel lasker instead of playing rook on c8 play first h4 h4 preventing from moving the queen to g3 and you know attacking g7 on or, or g6 so i think we can't blame the world champion for not finding all these lines after rook on c8 okay this was the only move which could save um, the game however we have h4 and now feel free to pause the video and find the only winning continuation for white while i enjoy my cup of tea ready so there is only one continuation and if you follow me with all of these lines and all of these tactics what's going on you know that before starting uh, any attack first you have to move rook on a1 extremely strong move and now black don't have much moves so uh, emmanuel lasker play bishop on e7 yes harry pillsbury found this move rook on a1 so can you imagine how strong player he was this was the only winning move here uh, and how now we have bishop on e7 and now continuation rook a4 luring the bishop and now black can play whatever uh, but losing the minor piece of course means that white would have the easy game so emmanuel lasker take the rook so take the challenge and he doesn't have much choice here and here of course knight d on e6 f takes on e6 and knight on e6 and now very difficult decision for emmanuel lasker if he plays something like queen on c8 and try to save the queen it just doesn't work queen on c8 or any other move uh, means that queen f5 and white gonna have decisive attack and black can do nothing about that queen on c6 one of the lines bishop on g5 attacking the last defender of the king uh, black what black can do is queen on b6 but then we have a d4 and now queen is coming to f7 with check and uh, taking the bishop so black would have to play something like uh, king on d7 but now the position is so complicated but there are a lot of uh, ways to win so knight on c5 is possible but also maybe more fancy would be knight on f4 and now is check of course so king on e8 and now bishop on e7 and bishop can't be taken because of this beautiful tactic so that would be a fork so queen d4 with check king h1 and if black take the bishop now it doesn't work because now we have queen on f6 with check and if king on d7 then e6 winning the queen so that's the one way 
And if king on e8, then actually is a checkmate. So doesn't really matter. Knight on e6. Now king on d7, the only move. Queen on f7, king on c6. Queen on c7 with check. King b1. Now rook b1. King a6. And now we would have a checkmate. Of course, black could throw some pieces, uh, some pieces, but it doesn't really matter as they are controlled by the rook. So this is why in this position, Emmanuel Lasker don't even try to move the queen and he try different ways. So he play bishop on d7 and Emmanuel Lasker was known from the finding some resources, you know, in totally lost positions and try to find some savings. So that was his best estimation what he could find. Of course, we have knight on d8 winning the queen, uh, rook on d8. And now bishop on c5, forcing black to exchange the bishops. We have rook on c8. And now bishop on e7, king on e7. And now queen on e3. Rook on c6, now uh, trying to double the rooks. But Pillsbury, of course, is not interested in playing against a pair of rooks. So he play queen on g5 with check, king f7, and now rook c1 forcing black to exchange the rooks. So we have rook on c1, queen on c1, and now rook c8. We have queen e1, and now h3, trying to uh, destroy the structures of the, of the pawns. We have g takes on h3, rook g8 with check, king f2, and now a4. So uh, this is the last chance trying to activate the past pawns, which should be pushed, of course. But now we have queen on b4. So uh, queen want to get to d6 and, you know, create a lot of problems for white. So this is why Emmanuel Lasker play rook on g6, but uh, controlling, of course, d6 and keeping an eye on b6, okay? Uh, now we have king on f3 and now a3, so exchanging the pawns, uh, queen on a3, now rook on b6 and now queen c5, attacking the rook, rook has to be moved of course, so rook on e6, Pillsbury play queen on c7, attacking the bishop, so king on e7 and now king f4, attacking this pawn. Uh, and now we have b6. It's kind of fortress, but it's impossible to keep that, you know, intact because there are too many weaknesses in the black position and also white have this passed pawn. So uh, it's too much for black to hold. We have h4, rook c6 attacking the queen, queen b8, and now bishop on e8, creating the barrier to uh, h5. But now the problem is this pawn stay without the protection. So we have king on f5. And now rook on h6. So trying to eliminate these pawns. Uh, we have queen on c7, king on f8. Now queen on d8 and b5 by Lasker. We have e6, uh, rook on h7, now king e5. And now b4. And now after queen on d6 with check and attack on the pawn, Emmanuel Lasker resigned the game. And he resigned because he don't see any chances. So for example, if he play king on g8, then queen b4 eliminating one pawn, uh, rook h5, just some checks, but doesn't really matter. King d6, rook h7, queen b8 attacking the bishop. So it's force king f8. Queen d8, now black has no move, so rook a7, but now white actually can push the pawns, h5, because the bishop is uh, pinned. Uh, rook a6, just some checks, but it doesn't matter, king e5. Rook a1, if black try to, you know, uh, attack from, the, from behind, doesn't really matter, h6. Checkmate, of course, is coming, and... Uh, and yeah, black don't have much options now, f1, but queen g5, uh, rook e1, king d6, and now checkmate is coming, uh, black can just throw some pieces, but that's all. This is why in this position, world champion Emmanuel Lasker resigned the game. And I hope you enjoy it. This game was really, really mind-blowing. Very beautiful placed uh, pieces and very beautiful coordination and all the plan of the game and execution till the end, winning the queen. One of the 
nicest games Harry Pillsbury played so I wanted to show just that game and yeah I hope you enjoy it like me and if you like it just press like and if you don't like it for some reason but I don't believe you press and like and press subscribe smash the bell button if you don't want to miss any other games this caliber and thanks for watching see you in the next one